Hey, somebody needs to connect to Bluetooth. You have? Excellent. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. You are listening to The Professional Noticer. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Andrews. Hey, thank you for making me a part of your week. My purpose here today and with every show we do is to play the part of a best friend or coach. I want to help you live the life of your wildest dreams by giving you access to the greatest mentors the world has to offer today. This week, the professional noticer is sponsored by WisdomHarbor.com. Today, families and school systems all over America are finding WisdomHarbor.com's one-of-a-kind streaming service to be the perfect, low-cost, high-quality educational tool for their students. Wisdom Harbor's stated responsibility is to create the next greatest generation, starting with your hometown and your school system. For less than $3 a month per teacher, classrooms have access to original content only found on wisdomharbor.com that teaches, entertains, and builds character in young people while creating conversations between young people and the adults in their community. Utilizing video, audio, and the written word, content is delivered in small bites by Grammy winners, CEOs, comedian chefs, best-selling authors, and Hall of Fame speakers. There are even guitar lessons from an award-winning songwriter. Check it out today and join your friends and neighbors who are already a part of WisdomHarbor.com. And isn't it time your schools got involved? WisdomHarbor.com, creating America's next greatest generation, starting with your hometown. Observations and answers. That's what we do here on The Professional Noticer. And today we have a very unusual offering for you. Usually we're interviewing some mentor that would be uh, important in your life. Today uh, we're taking a step down and it's just going to be me. But we got something special for you. Uh, We've been uh, asked by Audible to record an audio book of one of my books that has been out of print for a while, and uh, people are evidently trading it on the internet quite often. The book is called Return to Sawyerton Springs, and it's uh, a story of the town that I grew up in, and uh, the the title of the, the book is Return to Sawyerton Springs, a mostly true tale filled with love, learning, and laughter. And so <clears throat> we're going to Obviously, over the next week or so, going to be recording the the whole book for Audible. And it occurred to us here at the Professional Noticer that you might be interested in seeing how a book is recorded and seeing the behind the scenes. And, and so we thought we would do the author's note and the first two chapters for you. And and uh, let you see how it's done with the stops and starts. We're we're not editing this podcast. We will we will show you when I screw up, when my stomach rumbles, and Matt says, "Hey, do you got to do that again, or go eat lunch, or something?" And and so you'll see Matt. You'll see the area in there, the 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 technical stuff, and. Um, we thought you would enjoy that. And then if you're interested, when the book comes out on Audible, you can get it there and hear the edited version when you heard the the how it was done version. So we're going to do the, um, the author's note and the first two chapters for you today. And so, Matt, are you about ready? That's a thumbs up. Okay. All right. Well... Here we go. Wisdom Harbor Audio presents Return to Sawyerton Springs, a mostly true tale filled with love, learning, and laughter. Written and narrated by Andy Andrews. Dedicated to Kevin and Glenda Perkins, to remain best friends from childhood through high school, college, and adulthood is a rare thing indeed. I am honored to know you both. Author's Note Through the years, I've been described by friends and family as an optimist and a pessimist. I've been labeled focused and disorganized. Once, my wife publicly praised my ability to compromise on the same day she later criticized me for having a stubborn nature. Here and now, I confess that it is all true. 
I am calm and hot-headed, observant and oblivious, a master of my emotions and a blubbering mess. I am a man who has reached this point in my life without medication or incarceration. I consider myself normal in every sense of the word. I am neither a great success nor a slovenly failure. I'm happy, except when I'm sad. I'm energetic, except when I am tired, and patient with my children, except when I am not. In what many call the middle-aged years of my life, I've become comfortable with the idea that I'm a walking contradiction. On occasion, I'm even proud of the fact. But there's no doubt in my mind that my hometown is to blame. They made me what I am, and I am not alone. Amazing, isn't it? Our hometowns have sent us into the world with mispronunciations, odd habits, and predetermined beliefs about ourselves and each other. And we have stories, stories we tell and retell about the people with whom the fabric of our lives was inexorably woven. Sawyerton Springs, Alabama is such a place. It's more memory to me now than... Oh, let me um, start over on that line, Matt. Okay. <clears throat> Sawyerton Springs, Alabama is such a place. It is more memory to me now than geographic location, though I occasionally visit to catch up on the kind of news that never seems to make it to Google or MSN. Who died? Who got married? What happened at the wedding that you will not believe? Those kind of things. The town is not famous. In fact, it is missing from several state maps. There's nothing there that is the biggest or the best or the first of anything. There is, on second thought, a last distinction held by Sawyerton Springs. Myra Fletcher had lived her entire 86 years at the home in which she was born just outside of town. The two-acre lot bordered a wooded area where an artillery battle had been fought during the Civil War. A point of pride for the Fletcher family had long been the cannonball stuck high up in the old oak tree where it could plainly be seen. Over time, a limb had grown from the spot, making the large sphere more and more visible. It was a blustery March morning when the cannonball finally fell. Myra, everyone assumed when they found her, had been raking leaves under the oak when she was fatally struck on the head by what was later determined to be a 12-pound ball of iron. It wasn't until the funeral two days later that everyone realized that Myra Regina Fletcher had become the last official casualty of the Civil War in 1974. I grew up in Sawyerton Springs. I've somehow repressed much of what happened during those years and have rarely, if ever, related these memories. Why, I do not know. I hope it's not embarrassment, though if I were entirely honest, that might be a factor. No one can bring down a cloud of mortification like those who know us best. And they do know me there. This was the place I learned to shake hands with a firm grip and Look a person in the eye when you do it. Someone in this small town that raised me to be the man I now am remembers my first laugh, my first cry, and my first curse word. Of course, as one might expect, those memories are held over me, dangled occasionally for public consumption by the local keepers of humility. The very week one of my books first hit the New York Times bestseller list, I was reminded by the mayor from the podium at the Rotary Club luncheon about the time Billy Pat Williams put down the word suit in the Rotarian Scrabble tournament, and I immediately jumped up and yelled, Sue it? What kind of word is Sue it? The message was clear. You're not any smarter than the rest of us. Smart or not, as an author who is no longer under the gun or tied to a particular genre, I've taken a year to complete this written documentation of my hometown. I've included the community's current activities in addition to my recollections of its past. Don't expect this to be a complete or thorough history of my childhood or of Sawyerton Springs itself, as I was determined to leave out the boring parts. And I did. Andy Andrews, Orange Beach, Alabama. 
<laughs> Great. Okay. And then we'll just pick up here with uh, Summer. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> Summer, Chapter One. In a town without a movie theater or a fast food restaurant, life is divided into three distinct seasons football, basketball, and baseball. Weeks, months, and yes, time itself revolves around the children, their practices and games. Most kids played all three sports, but at 11 years of age, I didn't weigh enough to play football, and measurements for basketball had me at a lofty four feet five inches. It was baseball for me and had been for several years. This year, however, I was going to be a starter at second base. As we milled around, one could easily pick out the kids from last year's team. Lee Payton, Kevin Perkins, Steve Kratzer, Philip Wilson, Charles Raymond Floyd, and of course, me. We all had on last year's hats. They were off-white with a dark blue bill and a big FNB on the front. First National Bank, our sponsor, would be giving everyone new hats. We knew that. But in the meantime, we wanted to be sure that our new coach could tell the veterans from the rookies. None of us had met our new coach. His name was Mr. Simpson. He was, we were told, new to the area. New to the area and new in town were two different things. If someone was new in town, that generally meant he had moved from someplace we had heard of and was probably still within driving distance of his cousins. New to the area, however, was a hint that this person was from the north. Living as we did in the southern part of Alabama, north to me was Birmingham. At the time, I suppose I was somewhat suspicious of people from the north. To be certain, it was a tiny distinction, yet the phrase brought visions of Vikings and pillaging to my mind. This created an intense curiosity about Mr. Simpson, almost a feeling of danger. After all, I had been told more than once that these people could be nice, but they were different. The word different was always articulated with a pause before it and with eyebrows raised. Mr. Simpson parked his station wagon and gathered the equipment from the back. Bats, balls, catcher's gear, yeah, it was all there. We were watching him from the backstop as if he were some wild animal at the zoo. We noticed a boy with him. The boy had red hair and more freckles than I had seen on any human since my Aunt Nancy Jane, and she had freckles on her fingernails. The boy, we figured, was the coach's son, since Mr. Simpson also had red hair and more than his share of freckles. Hi, boys, Mr. Simpson said as he dumped the equipment near home plate. My name is Hankin Simpson. I'm your new coach. I glanced to my right. Kevin Perkins was smirking and looking at me. Kevin was kind of a smart aleck, and I knew what he was thinking. Hankin, where did he come from? Placing his hand on the shoulder of the red-headed boy, Mr. Simpson continued, I want you to meet my son. This is Hankin Jr. I didn't dare look toward Kevin. I didn't need to. I could feel him smirking from where I was. Now, boys, the coach continued, I'm new to the area. Well, I thought that explains Hankin. But I'm sure, he said, it's going to be a great season. Okay? Okay. Now, before we begin practice, everybody take a wrap. And with that, he clapped his hands and busied himself arranging the equipment. We shuffled our feet and looked at each other. What, we wondered, did he want us to do? Take a what? A wrap? What was a wrap? Hankin, Jr., we saw, had begun to trot around the field, and figuring that he knew what he was doing, we trotted after him. Wrap is a northern word, whispered Philip as we jogged along. It means to run. I wasn't sure whether to believe him or not. Kevin was a smart aleck, but Philip Wilson made things up. He was what five-year-olds called a storyteller, what we called a fibber, and what adults called a liar. He could look you right in the eye, tell you a fib so convincingly that you never doubted a word he said. Even though I had never trusted him, I kept him as a friend because I'd heard my dad tell my mom that Philip was certain to become president one day. 
back at home plate, all out of breath from running a <laughs> Pick up right there again. Huh? Uh, pick up right there again at the back up at back at home plate. Okay. <clears throat> back at home plate, all out of breath from running a rap, we gathered around Mr. Simpson, quite sure that he would now assign positions. We veterans thrust our cap toward his face, a virtual sea of FNBs silently pleading with the man not to look at one of us and say, right field. Since time began, all little leaguers have had an instinct... Mm. Okay, since time began? Since time began, all little leaguers have instinctively feared right field. There are nine positions on a baseball diamond, and in the glamour department, right field ranks dead last. Most batters are right-handed and will hit the ball to left field. Therefore, a coach who desires to avoid long losing streaks will naturally place his weakest player in right. I'd had my brush with this humiliation two years earlier as the weak link for Henley's hardware, green hat, white H. Standing in right field game after game with nary a ball hit my way, I never believed the adults who told me I was an integral part of the team. I couldn't catch, but I wasn't stupid. A permanent residence in right field was an embarrassment. It was a curse. I was certain I had been branded for the rest of my life. I could imagine myself as a grown-up going to job interviews and being told, we're sorry, there's no place for you at NASA. We see on your record you played right field. Boys, Mr. Simpson began, we're going to be a winner this year. I'm excited about this team. Before we really get going, I want to check you out at certain positions. Don't worry if you're new to the game on my team, everyone gets to pray. Excuse me? Did he say pray? I looked at Steve Kratzer. He was jabbing Charles Raymond Floyd in the ribs. Lee Payton was jabbing Kevin, and Philip jabbed me. I know this is just practice, the coach continued, but no matter, I want you to pray your hearts out. This team, I thought, is in trouble. Either someone had told our new leader that last year we lost 17 out of 23 games, or he took one look at us and decided we were a bunch of rejects. What it boiled down to, I was beginning to believe, was that if we were to have any chance of a winning season, Mr. Simpson had settled on prayer as our only hope. Thirty minutes later, we were in the positions that would be ours, more or less, for the rest of the year. I was at second base, so I was happy. Steve was at first, Kevin at third, Lee was our catcher, and Charles Raymond stood in right field with the other kids who couldn't catch. Philip Wilson, meanwhile, pouted at shortstop. He wanted to pitch. Actually, we wanted him to pitch too, but as soon as we had seen that there was a Hankin Simpson Jr., we knew that he would not. Every member of First National Bank was acutely aware of that age-old Little League law, if the coach has a son, the team has a pitcher. This has become such an accepted part of coaching methodology that it is no longer questioned. A Little League coach is usually the father of one of the players, and he always has a blind spot where his child is concerned. Can the kid throw strikes? Has he got a curveball? Does he trip over his own feet? None of that really matters. He's the coach's son, so put him on the mound. He's a pitcher. We practiced hard that first day, trying to show Mr. Simpson our stuff. We dove for grounders, we swung for the fence, and generally showed as much hustle as we could muster. We didn't seem to be a vastly improved team from the year before. I blew a sure double play, our pitcher threw the ball over the backstop, and Charles Raymond got hit in the head by a pop fly and cried. Coach Simpson didn't say much, but when he did, he was still saying things we didn't understand. Take another rap. Pray hard. Pray hard. We were a confused group of kids. It was at the end of practice, however, during the compulsory pep talk, when everything became crystal clear. There's one thing about this game you can count on, he said. If you do not learn to watch the baseball, hit the baseball grove, you will never be an excellent baseball player. 
Well, we were stunned. After two and a half hours of total darkness, we suddenly understood. A rap? Pray? He had wanted us to take a lap. He had wanted us to play hard. How could we have been so blind? From the depths of a pep talk to which no one was listening anyway, like a bolt from the blue, those weird words all came together and made sense. Certain words from his last sentence jumped out at us like sparks from a bonfire. Blah, 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 run, blah, 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 base bar, blah, blah, base bar, grove, bar, bar, weir, blah, blah, excellent, base bar, prayer. It was now an undeniable fact that had become apparent to us all in one fell swoop. Coach Simpson could not say his L's. We stood, silently exchanging furtive glances as Hankin, junior and senior, got in their car and drove away. No one had spoken a word yet, but we all suspected we had been the recipients of a miracle from God. We could scarcely contain our collective excitement. To a group of 11-year-old boys, nothing beats having a human target at which to laugh. Double the fun if the boys are able to mimic the target, and triple if the unfortunate target happens to be an adult. Kevin was smirking again. We shuffled around and snickered a bit. Then it started. Charles Raymond said, I'm a baseball prayer. Steve answered him, No, you ain't. You're a right fearder. Kevin said, Take a rap. Take a rap. Philip, did you hear him call me Philip? Lee added in, Coach Simpson, I like him. I really do. And so it continued until we were exhausted. Finally able to breathe at last, we lounged in the dirt around home plate. Philip spoke first, this time seriously. I think he's Oriental, he said. Oriental people use the letter R in place of the letter L when they speak English because they don't have the letter L in their own language. That's why he does it. Coach Simpson is Oriental. Remember, he said he was new to the area. He's Oriental. Oriental, Charles Raymond asked. Is that... Is that like when you know your way around? Kevin smirked. No, stoop, he said. He means Japanese, right? Kevin glanced my way. I wanted to tell Philip I had never seen a six foot three inch, 240 pound, red haired, freckle faced Japanese guy before. That's what I wanted to say. But Philip was looking at me with such an air of self confidence that I knew the truth did not stand a chance against such a convincing opponent. I was about to give it a try anyway when Lee suddenly giggled. What? we demanded. I was just thinking, <laughs> Lee said as he tried to talk through his laughter, I was just thinking that this year sometime I'm going to be rounding third. <laughs> he stopped and laughed. I'm going to be rounding third, headed toward this here home plate. And he was really laughing now. Tell us, we urged. I'm going to be headed toward this here home plate, and Coach Simpson's going to yell, Shride, re shride. We never mentioned the Oriental theory again. Kevin told me privately one day that he thought Philip was full of mess. I took that to be Kevin's way of saying he didn't believe Coach Simpson was Japanese either. Not that it would have mattered. One of our best friends, Peter Chin, was Japanese or something. And he said his L's perfectly, except, of course, when he was mimicking Coach Simpson with us. Several memories of that year still remain clear in my mind. To this day, Philip Wilson is fear up to everyone who played on that team. And no one has forgotten the game that Lee Payton rounded third, headed for home, and fell down before he got there, laughing, because Coach Simpson really did yell, Sride, re Sride! If I had to choose one capsule of time during that season to carry with me for the rest of my life, it would have to be the day that Steve Kratzer got kicked off the team. Maybe kicked off is too harsh. Actually, he was transferred to another team because the league president found out that Steve's family was living in another district. It was a messy situation. Steve had played with us for four years— two years on Henley's Hardware, and two with First National Bank. Now they were sending him to play with the team Sand Dollar Shoes, 
near his home. We were sick. Steve was our friend and a darn good first baseman. He didn't want to go. We didn't want him to leave. But that last day did arrive. When practice was over, Coach Simpson gathered us around the pitcher's mound. He had his hand on Steve's shoulder. Boys, he began, this is a sad day. We're going to miss Steve. He's a fine bar prayer and a fine young man. Steve was close to tears. We were, too. I don't understand the inner workings of the system, Coach Simpson continued, and I'm not sure why this has happened. But I do know one thing, and look at me when I say this, because this is important. I want every one of you to know that this was not Steve's fart. As a group, Steve included, we jumped as if 10,000 volts of electricity had passed through our bodies. Did he say what we thought he said? Surely not. No, he went on, this was not Steve's fart, and it wasn't my fart. Yes, he most definitely absolutely said what we thought he said. Oh, sure, we knew what he meant. We'd been unconsciously translating Simpsonisms all year. He was telling us it wasn't Steve's fault. But that wasn't what we were hearing. It wasn't Steve's parents' fart either. I guess, really, it was just nobody's fart. It was too good to be true. Of all the words in the world guaranteed to make 11-year-old boys laugh, only one of them is all by itself at the top of the list. And our coach, an adult, was saying that word over and over and over. If it's anyone's fart, it's the system's fart. So just don't pin the fart on any one person because it is just not their fart. Well, I'm not exaggerating when I say we were literally rolling on the ground. We were crying. Coach Simpson thought we really were crying and became concerned. He sounded desperate as he tried to comfort us, but the more he explained that it wasn't our fart, the more out of hand things became. Soon, tears were rolling down Coach Simpson's face, too. Several of us felt badly about that later, but as Kevin pointed out, hey, don't worry about it. It ain't our fart. I haven't seen Coach Simpson in years. Kevin Perkins and Steve Kreitzer were in my wedding. Lee Payton went to medical school and returned to practice in our town. Charles Raymond Floyd was a late bloomer. He was a center fielder in college, made second-team All-American, and played three years of minor league ball. I've totally lost track of Philip Wilson. The last I heard, he was a used car salesman and perpetually campaigning for mayor in a small town in Louisiana. Kevin, incidentally, is still my best friend, though he continues to live in Sawyerton Springs, and I have long since moved away. I still remember us all as we were that summer. I can close my eyes and hear the explosions of laughter as we react to something that was to us the funniest thing in the world. And I feel a little sad when I think that when we were 11 years old, we may have laughed harder than we ever would again. Okay, that that good? Perfect, perfect. All right, that chapter's in the books. Let me get a swig of water. Chapter 2, it's still summertime. Oh, okay. Ready, Matthew? All set. <clears throat> See if I can get my kind of Yankee voice going for this one. Chapter 2. Howard and Sonia Peel exited the interstate and immediately heard a thump under the hood of their Mercedes. They looked at each other. Howard struggled and continued talking. Anyway, we're almost there, so we might as well get off the main road and see a little bit of the country. They heard another thump. Sonia glanced sideways at her husband. Is there something wrong with the car? She asked. Maybe we should just go back to that service station at the exit. Nah, Howard answered. We're fine. It's probably just bad gas. It'll work itself out. Thirty minutes later, Sonia said... Nah, we're fine. It's probably just bad gas. It'll work itself out. They were walking at the time. 
The Peels are from Chicago. Howard worked as an account executive for a Fortune 500 company while Sonia had raised the kids. They were both in their 50s now, and their children were grown. For the last 20 years or so, Howard and Sonia had taken their family to the Gulf Coast every June. This, however, was the first time they had gone alone. Howard wanted it to be a special trip. He had certainly provided his wife with luxuries. She drove a Mercedes and shopped at the finest stores in Chicago, but he felt Sonia needed some spontaneity in her life, and that is why he had decided to get off the interstate. Would you mind telling me why you got off the interstate? Sonia asked as she hobbled down the road in high heels. I mean, here we are, in the middle of southeast God knows where, walking into God only knows what kind of situation. Do you realize that something has happened on every trip we have taken in the last 20 years? At least we're not lost. Most of the time we're lost. And it's always because you won't ask for directions, but at least we're not lost. I remember the time, as Sonia babbled on, venting her anger, Howard thought about what she was saying. She's right, he mused, at least about me not asking directions. Why won't I do that? He suspected it was a man thing. He could never remember asking for directions. Howard tuned her back in. What was she saying? He thought. Oh, the bathroom deal again. Sonia was now talking about how Howard had not stopped at a rest area an hour ago. She had needed to go then, and now she was mad about it. Howard guessed that it was another man thing. He would never stop if he had a choice. It was a waste of time. He had a schedule. Here comes a car, Howard said, raising his eyebrows. They turned and faced the car, which was obviously intending to stop anyway. As it pulled onto the grass, Mike Martin rolled down the window. You folks need a lift, I bet, Mike said. I saw your car a couple of miles back. Hop in. Where are you headed? Howard asked. He was not about to trust just anyone. He was from the city. He had better sense than that. I'm going home, Mike answered. Be more than happy to give you a ride in town. By the way, my my name's Mike Martin. What is the next town? Sonia asked. Mike was getting a little impatient. He knew from their accent that they were not from Foley or anywhere close, but they sure did seem distrustful. Sergeant Springs, ma'am, it's only six and a half miles up the road. Of course, if you'd rather walk. No, no, they said and scrambled into the car. Sonia sat in the front, Howard in the back. He wanted to keep an eye on Mike. He seems like a nice enough guy, Howard thought. But you never know. He might have a body in the trunk. So, Mike, what do you do for a living? Howard asked. I'm a mortician, Mike answered, and he hit the gas. Entering town, Sonia noticed the welcome sign. Sawyerton Springs, a town you will like. Sonia wasn't so sure. Mike had already told them they were stuck at least until tomorrow morning, but Howard refused to accept it. He insisted that they stop at a service station, so Mike pulled into Dick Rollins' place. It was the only one in town. Hey, Dick, Mike said as they drove up. I'm surprised you're here. I'm not, Dick said, smiling. I just ran by to get my pistol. I'm the starter for the kids' races today. Mike turned to the Peels. The town has a picnic every year to kick off the summer, he explained. It's out by Bowman's Pond. We do sack races and stuff like that. Howard nodded, then spoke to Dick. Mr. Uh, Rollins, is it? I'm Howard Peel from Chicago. This is my wife, Sonia. We are on our way to the coast. Our car is broken down out on County Road 10, and we really need to get it worked on. Love to help you, Dick said. Sure would, but I got to be at the picnic in 20 minutes. Howard bit his lip. Is there anyone else here in town who can fix the car? Yeah. Dick answered. Joe Bullard could do it in a heartbeat. Roger Luker, he's kind of our cop. He could do it. Kevin Perkins, Rick Carper, Tom Henley, all of them guys know cars. Miss Luna Myers could probably handle the job. She works on her own car, you know. Great, Howard said to Mike. Let's find one of those people. Well, I know where to find them, Mike said, but it won't do you any good. Why is that? Howard demanded. 
They're at the picnic, Mike said this, as if it were something Howard should have figured out for himself. Look, we have a nice hotel about two blocks away. Won't you let me run you over there? You can get checked in and freshened up, and then you two can join us at the picnic. If, if this was an emergency, it'd be different. Howard's face. Mm. Come and pick up. If this was an emergency, it would be different. Howard's face was blood red. This is an emergency, he yelled. Is anybody dying? Dick asked. No, Howard said grudgingly. Then it ain't no emergency, Dick replied. I'll see you at the picnic. The Vine and Olive Motel. It's a hotel. Yep, yep, pick up there. Okay. The Vine and Olive Hotel on Main Street is really just a big old house but Tony and Christy Hamilton had turned it into a 10-room bed and breakfast back in 1964. It was a two-story wooden structure painted white and had green shutters. The huge wraparound porch was lined with rocking chairs. Christy said, We won't be serving supper tonight. Everybody's eating at the picnic, but don't worry. There'll be plenty for you. Breakfast tomorrow morning, 7.30 sharp. Here's your key. Room two. And that'll be $24 in advance. As they entered the room, Howard was relieved to see that it did have its own bathroom. If it hadn't, he thought, I'd never turn my back on Sonia again. So what do we do now? He asked. The first thing I'm doing is taking off these shoes, Sonia said. My feet are killing me. Did you notice there's no television? But there is a bathroom, Howard pointed out. There was a knock on the door. It was Tony. Y'all want to ride over to the picnic with us? He asked. We have a horse and buggy we hook up for things like this. Come on, you'll love it. There's nothing to do here. Seeing Tony's point immediately, Howard and Sonia decided to take him up on the offer. It was the first time either of them had ever ridden in a buggy, and to Sonia's surprise, she actually enjoyed it. What's your horse's name? She asked Christy. Governor? She said, we named him that because of the resemblance between the part of the horse you're watching now and the face of the guy holding the office. They all laughed. Sonia found herself enjoying Christie's company. At the picnic, Christy and... Mm. Sonia found herself enjoying Christie's company. At the picnic, Christy introduced her to several of the ladies, including Fonsi Bullard, who Sonia said looked familiar. After only a few minutes of talking, they realized that a friend of Sonia's in Chicago had a picture of Fonsi in her living room. She was one of Fonsi's best friends from Tulane. Howard helped Tony with the buggy rides. While Tony made trips around the pond, Howard talked with the other men and watched the children play. I've never been to a place like this, Howard said to Mike. How long have you lived here? All my life, Mike answered. Do you ever want to leave? Sometimes, but only for a week or two. Our children are here, our friends are here, the school's good, the air's clean, and people look out for each other. Howard turned and looked to where Sonia was sitting on a quilt with Christy. They seemed to be old friends. His wife was actually howling with laughter. He hadn't seen Sonia that happy in a long time. You know, Mike, he said, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I always thought of you guys down in this part of the country as... Sort of dull or slow, but you're not. No, Mike said, grinning, and y'all up your way probably aren't all jerks either. Just then, Dick walked up. Hey, Howard. Hey, Mike, he greeted the men. Howard, I got through the last race and towed your car in. I already got it fixed. Wasn't nothing but a host of the fuel pump. You're ready to go, bud. Howard frowned. Dick, I, I want you to do me a favor. I've... Never been here, but for some reason I feel like I'm where I belong, at, at least for now anyway. All of a sudden, I don't want to go to the beach. I'll pay you $50 extra not to tell my wife the car is fixed. Dick smiled. Well, I'm not charging you for the repairs, he said. I felt bad about keeping you around here longer than you wanted in the first place. But as for telling your car... Uh, hmm. Yeah, just pick up at the beginning of that paragraph. Okay. Dick smiled. Well, I'm not charging you for the repairs, he said. I felt bad about keeping you around here longer than you wanted in the first place. 
But as for telling your wife about the car, I'm sorry, but I already did. Howard's face fell. But if your intention is to stick around, Dick continued, I don't think you have a problem. Your wife tried to give me a hundred not to tell you. Perfect. All right. So that's what it's like to do a narration for an audiobook. And I think my stomach was quiet, right? You know, I, I quite often skip breakfast. But when we're doing the, and I know breakfast is the most important meal of the day. You don't need to write me and tell me that. I've already heard that. Um, I still, sometimes I skip. I'm just not hungry. I'm not hungry. So uh, in any case, when we do the audiobooks, when we're recording something, I have to eat breakfast because this microphone is so sensitive that if my stomach growls and I keep reading, I'll think Matt didn't hear that. Yeah, he heard it. And it would go on the recording. And so Matt, Matt will say, okay, time to go eat something. And and so we'll, you know, we'll eat lunch or whatever and snack around just so that my stomach doesn't growl. Um, but we're going to finish this uh, this book within the next couple of weeks, and then it'll be sent to Audible, and we'll let you know when it's available if you'd like to hear the rest of the book and if you'd like to hear this edited down into what makes me sound like I'm a great reader instead of somebody that screws it up, makes mistakes. And I mean, if, if, you, if you're, looking for, you're looking for somebody really good at this, it's Matt. <laughs> Matt's the one that's really good at this. But we appreciate you being with us. Hope you had a great time. I'm Andy Andrews, the professional noticer, harnessing common sense and wisdom to plow through challenges all the way to an answer for you. And I think that'll do it for this week. Get us out of here, Matthew. So, ladies and gentlemen, and to the boys and girls who aspire to become ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of another episode of The Professional Noticer. In a world where common sense has become a superpower, I'm harnessing that tiny bit of mental energy I have for you. Seeking wisdom, making observations, and endeavoring to answer tough questions in a way that will empower your family and your business. I'm Andy Andrews. Until next week, goodbye. This episode of The Professional Noticer was produced by Matt Limpert. The Noticer theme, written and performed by Sugarcane Jane. Grilled oysters for the cast and crew, provided by Twinkle and Smoke of Beverly Hills. Additional financial consideration provided by the American Council for Artificial Stupidity. Are you one of those people who feel like you're already intelligent enough? Your IQ is well above average and no amount of additional knowledge or creativity will make a difference in your life? In fact, you consider yourself so darn smart that it has become a nuisance, creating a barrier between you and the ones you love. Friend, You've just described the perfect candidate for our program. The American Council for Artificial Stupidity is ready and waiting to sign you up. Your life can change today by appearing to be stupid, never mind it being an illusion. Artificial stupidity will make people want to talk to you slowly. Complete strangers won't simply rattle off directions. They'll take you by the hand and lead you there. You'll be coddled and helped in ways you'd never imagined. Heck, the government will even pay your bills. So sign up now. Go online to register. The American Council for Artificial Stupidity.com.